Hey, good morning, ACC. Hey, just real fast, I think it's fair to say real quick that the uh, sports affiliations you saw on that announcement video do not necessarily reflect the views of our church. Um, just uh, anyway, my name is Matt. I serve as a lead pastor here at ACC. I just wanted to thank you guys for being here, especially if this is your first time uh, with us. We're really excited because we as a church, uh, we, we want to be all about uh, people coming in and, and hearing about the love of Jesus here. We're also all about going out and sharing the love of Jesus out. And we're going to talk about that today. Uh, but I just want you to know we're really uh, thankful that you're here checking us out. Um, so my family and I, we just got back from a week of vacation. We were in Williamsburg this past week, which was uh, awesome. It was relaxing. And uh, we, uh, some of you may already know this, we have a, a slight addiction to escape rooms. Have you, anyone done an escape room before? Raise your hand if you know what I'm talking about. So they basically put you into a room and they, uh, you pay them, okay? You pay people to lock you into a room and then they give you an hour uh, to try to break out. So it's like a bunch of puzzles and clues and stuff and, and eventually, hopefully, you've solved the last puzzle and it's the, like the lock on the door, well, you know, the key or whatever. Anyway, it's tons of fun. We, we've done uh, 13 of them now uh, and we, uh, we love them. They're just such a blast to do. We had never done them as a family before. So uh, my, my family, we decided let's do an escape room together while in Williamsburg. And we were worried because my wife and I so far were batting a thousand. Okay, We haven't not gotten out of a room yet. So, so far we have a perfect record. And we're really worried that inviting our three daughters into this with us might mess that up. All right, so what we... We decide we're going to go. We're going to do it. Uh, we go and we do this first escape room. We had a ton of fun. We were able to break out. We loved it. The girls really enjoyed it. So then later in the week, we decided we were going to do another one. Okay? So we did another one. This one was like a King, Ar King Arthur and the round Knights of the Round Table theme. So there was this... Uh, you know, like there were swords and there was the, you know, the quest for the Holy Grail and all these different things that were parts of these puzzles that we had to figure out. And the, here's the nerve-wracking part about this room. You're in one room, and usually the goal is to get out of that room. But you can see while you're in this room that there is another room that you're trying to break into. And then once you're there, you have to break out of that room. So this is like a two-room room, okay? So we go, and we're in there, and we're thinking, well, we better only spend 30 minutes in this room because we're going to need the next 30 minutes for the next room. And as we're watching the clock, and now we're at like... 35 minutes into this thing and we still haven't even solved like one and a half of the clues to get into the next room we are literally like freaking out okay we're yelling to the person who's like watching on the cameras like help we need we need a clue and he's not responding and we're really worried that we're not going to get out how many of you guys have ever like been up against a clock before and you know the anxiousness that you feel uh you, you know what i'm talking about like you, you're about to run out of time you don't want to run out of time well, uh, uh, long story short, we were able to get into the next room and solve the puzzle with just a little bit of time to spare, and we're still batting a thousand. So that's that's good. Anyway, um, knock it off. All right. So this whole race against time thing, I think it relates to what I want to talk about this morning as we wrap up our Follow Me series because. I want you to understand that, that we've all felt that before. We've felt that inside of us, this idea that time is getting away from us. And here's a sobering statistic. I just want you to, to hear this at the very beginning. We're going to hear it again at the end, just to kind of wrestle with. There are 4.5 billion people alive right now that don't know about the love of Jesus. Let that sink in for a moment. That's more than half, by the way. That's 4.5 billion people who don't know about the love of Jesus. And the Bible is very clear that there is a finite amount of time that you and I will get to experience the mission that God has for us on this earth. And for those 4.5 billion people, there's a finite amount of time that they have a free will to make a decision whether or not they want to follow God and to fall in love with Jesus. And yet time seems to get away from us, doesn't it? I am reminded of a funny story. There's a, it's a true story of a guy named Larry Walker, uh, Larry Walter. And Larry, uh, he always wanted to, to be a pilot, but he just never was able to because he had bad vision. So one day he got this harebrained idea. He went to the Army-Navy surplus store 
and bought 45 weather balloons. And what Larry did is he took a lawn chair and he strapped it to the back of his pickup truck. And then he took the 45 weather balloons and filled them up and tied them to his lawn chair. And he had his friends helping him. And what he decided to do, he was only going to take three things with him on his journey. Now remember, his journey, according to him, was just to see things from a slightly different perspective was the goal of his journey. Okay? He decided to bring a peanut butter and jelly sandwich in case he got hungry. He brought a BB gun, which you'll learn about in a second. And he brought a six-pack of beer. So this is what Larry decided were the most important things to bring with him on his uh, gentle saunter up into, into the air. Uh, he got himself ready, had his friends pull kind of the, uh, the ripcord, if you will, to release his chair. And instead of gently gliding up the way he was expecting, his friends describe it, uh, what it might look like when a ball is shot from a cannon, is the way Larry uh, floated up in his lawn chair. Okay? Now here's Larry's plan. Larry was hoping, obviously, to go up slowly. And when he kind of got to the altitude he wanted to be at, he was going to shoot with his BB gun some of the balloons so that he could then kind of maintain uh, his altitude until he was done, in which case he would shoot more balloons and gently come back down to earth. Well, he, before he knew it, he had gone from where he was to 15,000 feet, okay? The altitude change combined with his six-pack of beer, he lost consciousness, okay? Larry lost consciousness on his journey, and uh, he ended up floating into LAX airspace where they had to, re, uh, you know, they had to shut down or, or re, what's the word? Like, reroute, reroute airplanes. Yeah, thank you guys. Uh, total mess, all right? Nothing happened the way Larry wanted. He ended up getting rescued. I assume they had to shoot down the balloons for him and help him come back down to earth. Um, but Larry, afterwards, they asked him, would you do it again? And he said, no. I wouldn't. Clearly wasn't from Glen Burnie, am I right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, anyway, um, they asked him, were you scared? He said, yes, I was scared. And then they asked him, why did you do it? And this response is awesome. He said, I just got tired of always sitting around. Just got tired of always sitting around. I feel like sometimes in our own lives, we probably have moments where we, we look back and we see how much time has just gone by. You know, you look back at the last, you're like, wait, all this time has gone by that quickly? I look at my, my oldest daughter and she's, she's 12 and I'm like, where did time go? You know, you just, you look back and you see like time is just flying and you wonder where has it been and you, you, you fear that you're kind of wasting life, that you're just kind of sitting around and not fulfilling the purpose that God has put you on this earth to fulfill. And that can be a very anxious feeling. I think it can cause a lot of anxiety to have this, this wonder and this feeling about whether or not you're doing with your life what you were called and made to do with your life. Larry got tired of sitting around, so he came up with this idea. I'm hoping we can come up with a better one together uh, this morning. We're going to finish our series today on Follow Me, the last chapter the last few verses of the book of Matthew with a specific call to go. What does a call to go look like? Let's pray and ask God to be with us. God, I ask right now that as we explore this, this idea of what it looks like to use our lives the way you've asked us to, to follow you the way you want us to, in this call to go, what does that look like? How do we do it? God, because at the end of the day, I want this to be a church where when we walk out of this building, God, we don't just leave with a, like a convicted feeling or a, an inspirational message, but that we walk away, God, looking more like you, that we take action based on the ways that you're working in our lives. So I pray that you would do that through this time together. Speak through my mouth. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So go ahead and grab your Bibles, and let's turn to Matthew chapter 28. Real fast, if you don't own a Bible, we have Bibles right in front of your chairs. Uh, you can grab one right in the seat in front of you, and we're going to be on page uh, 598 in that Bible. And feel free, if you don't own a Bible, go ahead and write your name on that Bible you just grabbed, 
and call it yours. You can take it home with you. That'll be our gift to you. Uh, So we're going to be looking at a passage at the end of Matthew 28. It's a very famous passage. We actually have given it its own name, this, this set of scripture. It's called the Great Commission. So if you've ever heard of the Great Commission, that's what we're going to be reading through today. And let's read, um, we're going to read 16 and 17 first. Let's, let's, let's read those together. It says, Then the eleven disciples left for Galilee, going to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some of them doubted. Let's stop right there for a moment. You have this, this picture, right? The uh, 11 uh, apostles, the 11 remaining apostles have been told to, to go to a mountain and, and meet Jesus there. Uh, many experts believe that this mountain would be a mountain that they were familiar with, probably the mountain from the Sermon on the Mount. Hey, remember guys, that, that one place where we had that talk? Meet me there. So they, they go and 11 of them are going, and I assume there's some other disciples and other followers of Jesus that go along also. And when they get there, they see Jesus. Now, the order of what happens here is really important. The first thing we see is that they, they go to this mountain together, and then we see that they see Jesus. That's really important. right? The, the, if they were wondering before, now most of us understand that death is a permanent thing. It's not something that reverses itself. So these 11 apostles, they haven't seen Jesus yet. And they understand that, that death doesn't normally reverse itself. So they must have been wondering, why are we even going to meet Jesus? Jesus is dead. But they go, all right? They go, and then they see. That's awesome. This order is really important. Now they see Jesus with their eyes, but what happens next is some of them worshipped him, and some of them still doubted. It's not wild. You have the guys who are like closest to Jesus that ought to know more than ever that Jesus is capable of bringing people back to life. They watched it with their own eyes, and to hear like, we're going to meet Jesus, and they go probably doubting the whole time, and then they get there, and they see Jesus, and now they must have been thinking, my eyes are playing tricks on me. Because that can't be Jesus. Now this word doubt is really important to understand. So I want to spend a a moment explaining it. It comes from a Greek word, uh, despazo. And it doesn't really mean disbelief. You see, they didn't go and then see Jesus and say, I don't believe that that's Jesus. Disbelief, there's another word for that, and it's not the word that was used. We have this word despazo, and a better maybe understanding would be the word a hesitation. They hesitated. One of the best ways I can explain hesitation is through uh, my experiences uh, of zip lining. Okay, zip lining is an incredibly fun thing if you've never done it. Um, I enjoy usually when I go to a a foreign country, they have zip lining adventures over treetops, which is really cool where you're zip lining through a forest. And as zip lining is one of those things, I've done it enough that I've, I've clearly, I've never died doing it, because here I am, right? I've never broken a bone doing it. I've, I've learned to trust the process. But, man, that first time you step into a zip line harness, you're looking at it, and it's like two inches of fabric around here and two inches of fabric around your legs, and there's this little, like, hook thing that's two inches of fabric that supposedly they're taking a little thing that, I, mean, I, I use it to hold my keys, okay, for my car, and that's supposed to hold me up. So they hook that on to a rope, and then onto you know, like a, a, a wire that's less than an inch thick, and this whole process is nerve-wracking. Now listen, even now, if, if I went zip lining now, it would probably be like the 50th time I've done it, but I'll tell you what, Every single time I go, I'll ask the question, hey, I'm, I'm 260 pounds. I'm good, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're good. Is you sure? Yeah, all right. You've done this before, yep. All right. Get harnessed in, and you put your toes out over the edge of that platform. And here's the, the word that goes through your head. Despazo. <laughs> it's hesitation. Like, I know, like, I don't disbelieve that when I leap off the edge that, that I'm, I don't think I'm going to die. I just hesitate. 
Like, go ahead, just, just jump out there. Well, you go, <laughs> right? Like, it, it, it's that hesitation, this despazo that was going through the minds of some of these original disciples. They saw Jesus with their eyes and yet hesitated. And I want to stop for a moment and throw out this side note. I believe there's some, probably multiple, many people in this room right now that you wish with all of your heart that the gospel, the good news of the Bible, is a true thing. You, you hope and you pray that the idea of there being a Jesus who loves you despite your failures, who, who wants to take you from a brokenness into a restored relationship with God and into an eternal relationship with Him, you want that to be true with your whole heart, but you're still at the edge of this platform. You know, you hesitate. I just want to tell you, I'm so thankful you're here. Just like some of the original apostles who hesitated in their belief when they saw a resurrected Jesus. You know, the the best thing about them is that they went. Even in their doubt, they still went to this mountain to meet Jesus. And even maybe in your hesitation, you're here right now. And you're on the edge. You, You doubt. But I just want you to know, you are in the right place, man to explore Jesus in your hesitation, okay? So these, these guys, they, they didn't disbelieve. They, they hesitated. And let's keep looking at verse now 18. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. There's a real specific word that's used there. Jesus is describing the authority that he has, and he uses a word to describe what kind of authority. And he says, I have been given what kind of authority? All. That's right. He's been given all authority. Not just authority over heaven, but authority on earth. He's been given all authority. And the cool thing about the book of Matthew, the Matthew's account of Jesus' life, is Matthew loved to record the authority of Jesus. You see it throughout the pages of Matthew. In fact, in Matthew chapter 7, uh, we we hear that Jesus taught with authority. Then in Matthew chapter 8, we see that Jesus healed with authority. Then in Matthew chapter 9, Jesus forgave with authority. Matthew chapter 10, Jesus sends out his disciples with authority. I think you guys are getting the hint, right? I can keep going through Matthew and see that Matthew loved to share and and highlight how Jesus' life was a living example of the authority that he has. You even just go back a few verses into Matthew 28, and we learn that Jesus even has authority over his own death. Anyone else in here have that kind of authority? So Jesus' life was just this living example of what authority over heaven and earth looks like. And he's basically telling his guys, listen, I have authority. Now listen, a side note again. This is another little thought for you. Jesus has all authority. That doesn't necessarily answer the question whether or not you submit to his authority. Think about that for a moment. Who has authority in your life over your time? Are you submitting to God's authority? Or are you claiming it for yourself? What about over your giftedness and your abilities? Who has authority over your checkbook? Who has authority over your language and your temperament? Who has authority over your relationships? Who has authority over your actions and your thoughts? This is a really hard one. Who has authority over your future and the plans that you've made for it? See, a lot of times in our life, we believe, Christian, that Jesus has all authority, and yet we go through our life acting like we have it all, right? We stay in control as often as we can, and we refuse to submit to the authority of Jesus, and we ought to knock that off because that's not the way uh, we, we live when we trust that Jesus has all authority. So he, he says basically to his, his disciples, listen, I have all authority. In fact, my life has been a living example of the authority that I have. By now, you ought to know 
and trust that I have authority. He says that because now he's about to say something else. He's about to say the word, therefore. In other words, if you trust that I have authority, if you trust that I'm one that you, sh- you ought to submit to, and that I have a good thing and a, and a control over your life, then, therefore. Think about this for a moment. How many of you would think it's a good idea to go up to a boss who asks you to complete a certain assignment and just look at your boss in the face and say, no. Or imagine going to school and your teacher's assigned a project and and the last day the project is due and you look up at your teacher and you say, no. Or children, maybe you know how this goes. Mom and dad ask you to do something and you look up to them and you say, no. It doesn't go well for you, does it? Right? We understand that in these situations, there are people that God has placed over our lives in places of authority. We understand what authority is. When someone has authority over us, we don't uh, usually, there's not usually a good reason to look at them and say no. And yet we, we claim as believers in Jesus to trust that Jesus has all authority. When I say Jesus has all authority, I think most people in this room who profess the name of Jesus, those of you who already consider yourselves Christians, you probably would say, yeah, yeah, I believe that. Yet somehow, where we're about to go in this verse, most of us look at that same Jesus, and then we say, "Mm -mm, I'm not going to do that. Because what he tells us to do next is really important. Verses 19 and the first part of 20, he says, therefore, in other words, if you trust that I have authority over your life, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. Let's pause there for a moment. In other words, If you are a follower of Jesus, followers of Jesus are called to go. It's a very simple verb. We've been called to go. In other words, there's not really kind of an an option for passivity here. We've been called as a, a, a truster that Jesus has all authority in heaven and on earth. What next? Believer, you've been called to go, to make disciples, to baptize people to teach them to love and obey God. You know what's even more interesting is that the word that's used here for the word go is actually, uh, it's better translated because of the way it's a a passive verb. Instead of translating go or when you go, a better translation is when you are going. In other words, it's just implied. Check that out. As a believer in Christ, it is understood that you will be going. Going. In other words, there's not really an option for if you go, if you consider yourself a follower of God, then you will be going. And if right now you're like, I don't ever go, then you ought to ask yourself a really, really hard question. Are you following the same Jesus we're talking about right now? Do you have a relationship with Jesus that is so real that you find examples in your life of you going, because that's the verb that's used here. When you go, make disciples, baptize people, teach them to love and obey God. There's a boy, and he's sitting in the the living room, and he yells to his mom, hey, mom, bring me some water. And mom isn't really pleased with the tone, and uh, he never said please, and he wasn't talking very nicely, so she says no. I need you to go get your own water. And he said, Mom, come on, give me some water. She said, no, you get up and get yourself your own water. He's like, Mom, bring me water now. And Mom said, oh, I'm coming in there right now to bring you something. (laughs) And he said, well, when you bring me whatever it is you're bringing me, can you also bring me some water? That's the kind of laziness that, this, that we have. We have this understanding that, okay, I've, I've, we say often from this stage that this church 
is not a cruise ship. I understand that the chairs that we've purchased have a lot of really comfortable padding. I'm really hoping that you're comfortable when you sit here. But don't let that confuse you because this is not a cruise ship. This is not designed for you to come and be like, uh, sing some really great songs and, and be inspired by the music and then, then hear a message and, and walk out of here feeling inspired and challenged by a great message and then just, just be entertained, if you will. This isn't a cruise ship designed for you to come and sit and be comforted. This is a fishing boat. The church has been designed to catch fish, to catch men, right? We are a fishing boat where everybody ought to be doing something. The action is not a, it's not a, a sitting. The action is going, it's doing, it's getting up and not being lazy. So brother and sister in Christ, those of you who have already professed the name of Christ, if you look at your life right now and say, you know what, I think I'm doing more staying than I am going. I want you to start really wrestling with maybe a change that God through his Holy Spirit might be prompting you to make in your life right now. Because that is not the kind of Christian life that God has called you to, believer. In Acts 1.8, these are the last recorded words of Jesus before his ascension. He says, but You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere. In Jerusalem and in throughout Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. You see, Jerusalem, that's that's the people like right around you. That's the people who are in your home. Maybe your neighbor right across the street. Maybe the people that are in your office a uh, little department area. These are, these are people that are in your Jerusalem, okay? Now, when we see Judea, this is people who are in, like, this city of Glen Burnie or Pasadena or uh, Severna Park, wherever, wherever it is that you are, are living right now. The people in your community, you know, ACC, God has places right here in the middle of Glen Burnie. This is our Judea. God has called us to take the gospel to the people of this community. Samaria, that's a little tricky. You see, Samaritans are... Not well liked. They're, Samaritans are those other people. You know what I'm talking about? You all have maybe a version of those people. People that maybe make you uncomfortable or you don't like to hang around them or they're different than you or they, they do things differently than you. They talk differently than you. Whatever it is, God has called us into Samaria. He's called us to go into places that maybe we're surrounded by people that we're not, we're not super comfortable And then he even takes it further. He's calling us into the ends of the earth. He's saying, listen, I want you to go and tell everyone has heard the good news of Jesus Christ. And here's some really hard statistics. 80% of people who claim to be followers of Jesus believe that we have a personal responsibility to share our faith. 80% of the people in this room right now believe that we have a personal responsibility to share our faith. If you are one of the 20% that don't believe that it's your responsibility to share your faith, let this message change your mind. I'm telling you, God's word is super clear. 100% of us, we ought to be unified in this church. We have been called to share the good news with others. Now here's the hard truth. Out of 100%, 61% of Christians do not share their faith. 4.5 billion people alive right now who are headed to an eternal separation from God. And yet 61% of us are treating this thing like a cruise ship. And I wrestle with it myself. Let me just be really honest with you, church. It's really easy for me in this context to share my faith because you expect it. You come to church. You're expecting the pastor to get on uh, the altar and to to share um, my faith. Man, you take me and put me into my context of my neighborhood, and I struggle just like you. This is a not something, you know, I, I, hope, I hope I'm setting an example that maybe I'm a little bit better at it than most of the people in my church. And I pray that's true, but I just want you to know I struggle with it too. 
So I had to ask myself, what are four reasons that we don't go and make disciples? And one of them is that you expect the church to do it. I put the word church in quotes because I think when somebody says this, what they're really saying is, I expect my pastor to do this. I expect the leaders at my church to do this. I expect to be able to invite people maybe to church and then let the church do the dirty work. But listen, at ACC, we ought to know this more than anybody. Guess who the church is? You are the church. We are the church. Individually, we make up the body of Christ. So if you are putting the onus of the responsibility to make disciples on the leadership of your church, you are missing something huge. In fact, we see in Ephesians 2.10, it says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Believer, get this. You were created. Your life has been given a purpose and a mission of the Great Commission. You've been called to this individually and personally. Don't keep waiting on your church to do the work for you. There are 1,500 people who call ACC their home church. And if you expect me to disciple all of them individually... It's not going to happen. You already know I struggle with it personally. We need to understand that we can't keep putting the responsibility on the church. We've been called individually to make disciples. Here's number two, why we don't go and make disciples. Another excuse we make. We don't want to be a hypocrite. We don't want to be a hypocrite, basically. Here's, here's the really hard truth. There are some people in this room right now that when you hear this phrase, go and make disciples, or even take that further, go and, and baptize people and teach them to love and obey Jesus, you think about your own life and you realize, if I went out to do any of those things right now, I would be a huge hypocrite. Because maybe you haven't even been baptized yourself. Maybe you are a follower of Christ and you know that you ought to be baptized, but you haven't been obedient to that yourself. I'm going to tell you what right now. If you go out and you start telling people they ought to be baptized, you're going to be a hypocrite. It's really going to put a huge damper on your ability to fulfill the Great Commission. If you have something going on in your life right now that you know doesn't honor God, you know it's something that ought to be cut out from your life. It's not, it's not loving God. It's not being obedient to his commands. And yet you just have decided not to care about it. And you're just letting it uh, fester in your life. Listen, you aren't going to be able to really fulfill the Great Commission the way God wants you to because you're going to be a hypocrite. Now here's the, the beautiful thing about this. The Great Commission does not require perfect people because I am not a perfect person. I have sin in my life more often than I like, more often than I want to admit. But the difference is I recognize that it's going to put a barrier between me and my relationship with God and me and my ability to fulfill the Great Commission. So when I see it, as often as I can, especially when brothers and sisters come around me and point it out, I ought to do whatever I can to cut it out. You know, we have this churchy word that we like to use, repent. You know, you expect maybe to come in, those of you who aren't uh, or maybe new to church, oh, here the pastor's on stage using that word, repent. You know, the, it's just a, a, a Bible word, if you will, for this uh, 2017 version. Let's just call it this. Knock it off. Whatever it is that's going on in your life right now that's keeping you from being able to share the good news of Jesus, cut it out of your life. Turn from it. Follow God. If you haven't been baptized, be baptized. Stop putting this, this area of disobedience between you and the Great Commission. Here's a, a verse in Luke 6, 46. It says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? If you profess to be a follower of Christ, what this verse means, church, is follow Christ. Do what the Bible says. Here's a third excuse we make why we don't go and make disciples. You don't want to be uncomfortable. 
Maybe it comes out in your mind more like, what will others think about me? Or I don't want to be that guy in the office. I don't want to be that guy in my neighborhood. I don't want to be that, that you know, Bible-thumping guy that everyone doesn't take seriously. And you, you have some sort of a shame that you feel that might happen if you ever shared your faith with someone. You know, it's wild. There's a magician, and he's also a comedian. I'm sure you guys have heard of him before, named Penn Gillette. He does a duo with Penn and Teller, so you know Penn and Teller. Well, Penn uh, Gillette, he's a, a, a proud atheist. He's very proud of his lack of, of belief in God. And at one of his shows, one of his fans came up to him after the show and handed him a New Testament Bible. And he said, I want you to have this, and on the inside of it, I wrote you a note And Penn accepted the gift and was really thankful for it. And later, he shared on his blog about this experience. And he said, you know, this guy, he came up to me and he he gave me this Bible. And I just, I think so highly of the fact that he did that. And here's why. This is what he said. How much do you have to hate somebody to not share your faith? How much do you have to hate someone to believe everlasting life is possible and not tell them that. Are you hearing that? That's from an atheist saying, how much do you have to hate someone to know that there is something good for them, to believe it with all your heart, that there's something, there's eternal life available to them, and then to keep your mouth shut. The only way he could process it in his mind was that word hate. Romans 10, 13 through 15 says this, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they have never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless somebody tells them? And how will anybody go and tell them without being sent? This is why the scriptures say how beautiful are the feet of of messengers who bring good news. Penn goes on to share this in his own way. He said, imagine for a moment if there's a a person standing and there is a semi-truck barreling down on them. And I see the semi-truck coming to kill them and they don't know about it and they don't see it and they can't hear me yelling at them because it's just too loud There comes a moment in this scenario where Penn says, I am going to tackle that person out of the way of the semi-truck. Because anything less than that would be hatred for that person. Remember, this is Penn Gillette, a professed atheist, saying, if I truly believe that someone is about to get hit and killed by a semi-truck, I don't care what it's going to do to my pants when I hit the ground. I don't care what it's going to do to my elbows or their elbows when they hit the ground. I'm going to do whatever I can to tackle them out of the way of that semi-truck. And anything less sounds like hatred to me. And yet, you and I, believers, you and I, uh, those of you in this room who, who profess the name of Christ, why do we struggle with this? Francis Chan says, either I don't really believe the Bible, or I'm extremely unloving. I'm more concerned about being rejected than I am about someone else's eternal destiny. Now, Francis Chan doesn't say this in the first person because he loves to share his faith publicly. But this is from a perspective of you and I who struggle to share our faith. How much do we have to hate someone to keep the greatest truth from them? Here's another reason we don't share our faith is that we feel inadequate. You might be thinking it another way. You might be saying in your mind, I just don't know what to say. Or what happens if they ask me a follow-up question and I don't know the answer to it? You know, that's a, a real fear, isn't it? When we want to talk to someone about our faith. Luke 12, 11 through 12 says this, And when you are brought to trial in the synagogues and before rulers and authorities, don't worry about how to defend yourself or what to say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you at that time what needs to be said. Here's what that means. When you commit to following Jesus, when you put yourself out on the ledge and you go and you tell someone about Jesus, 
You might not know exactly what to say, but you have a heavenly father, an Abba father, who is not going to send you on a mission empty-handed. He's not going to let you fail. He's going to be there to help you. It might not go exactly the way you planned, but Jesus is going to be there to give you the words or to provide uh, a solution to find an answer or to give you uh, some way to, 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 to know what to say. Here's what I want to encourage you with is this statement. I say it often. Go with what you know. Go. Church, remember we've been called to go. Go with what you know. Maybe you just gave your life to Christ yesterday. And all you know is that Jesus came down and he died on the cross in your place. And that through believing in him, your sins are forgiven and you can be restored into a, an eternal relationship with God. Maybe that's the limit of your understanding. It's just the basic, simple gospel. Go with that. You can walk across the street and say, let me tell you about a Jesus who changed my eternity forever. And if they ask you questions that you don't know the answer to, just trust the Holy Spirit to talk. Just trust the, the words that he provides to you. Maybe the words he provides are just going to be something simple like, you know what, I don't know. You want to look and find the answer together with me? Let's look at the very last part of verse 20. The last verse of Matthew. It says, and be sure of this. In other words, believer, if you've doubted other things, don't doubt this. Be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Basically, what's being said here is this. You know that all authority that Jesus has over heaven and earth? That authority is with you always. That Jesus is always on your side. He is there with you. So go trusting. In other words, believer, I want you to put that harness on. Despite your despazo, despite your, your, your hesitations, despite your excuses, the four things that maybe you, ha you aren't sharing your faith because of one of those, I want you to put your harness on and I want you to put your toes over the edge of this zip line and I want you to take a flying leap. I know because I feel it myself. I know your hesitation is real. I understand why it is you don't want to share your faith at times. And I understand why it can be difficult to, to trust. But listen, I, you know, one of my favorite things about ziplining is talking through someone through it who's never done it before. When somebody, you know, someone on like a youth retreat and they've never done ziplining before, they're always scared. They don't want to trust the harness. They don't want to trust the line. I tell them, listen, this is going to be awesome. Yeah, just, you know, I'll help them, you know, put it on and, and somebody will come and tighten them up. And hey, this guy, he knows what he's doing and nobody's ever gotten hurt uh, doing this. You're going to be fine. And you kind of talk them through it because you know that the moment they jump off, they're going to be, be excited about the experience. They're going to love what's about to happen. So I'm trying to trust me. This is me saying to my church just trust me get up to the edge of this zip line you've been called to get off of your bottoms and to take action and to go get over the edge and jump off trust the zip line trust all authority to be with you always god has a great plan for you in his great commission it's what you were created for do me a favor and, and bow your heads with me. The reason I'm asking you to bow your heads is just so you won't be distracted. I want to give you an opportunity. If you're in this room right now and you've, you've never given your life to Jesus, you've never trusted him to be the authority over your life. Maybe you've hesitated up until now but you're ready to, to, to jump or to slowly get off of this platform and to, to trust Jesus for the first time. If that's you, I want you to do me a favor. I just want you to stand right where you're at. I don't want you to be afraid anymore.
Stay standing right where you're at. I want to, everyone else is, your head, head's still bowed. If you need to trust Jesus this morning and he's calling you, Christian, you know you've been called to go and there's a specific name of someone that God is calling you to reach out to this week. Maybe it's a phone call you need to make. Maybe it's someone at work. Maybe it's a neighbor that you need to go knock on their door. You know there's a specific calling in your heart right now. God's calling you to go and to tell someone about the good news of Jesus. And you're going to commit to doing that this week. Would you do me a favor and stand up right where you're at? If God is calling you to share the good news of your faith with someone, stand up right now. And believers, maybe there's someone in this room that you've, you know you're being called into to going in a different capacity. Maybe God's calling you into a short-term missions experience. Or maybe he's calling you to a long-term missions experience somewhere to, to the ends of the earth. Maybe he's calling you to get on a plane and go visit a family member to share your faith. If God's calling you to go in a capacity like that, would you do me a favor and, and stand up? I just want to pray over you. Guys, this is really cool. All over this room, keep your heads bowed. We're going to pray together. But there are people, um, God, that you're calling. And you call us to follow you. God, as followers of you, and trusting that you have all authority. God, there's no reason that we ought not say yes to whatever it is you're moving us to. And I thank you specifically for those who are standing, God, that you've, you've placed a specific decision in their lives today. God, for those who want to give their lives to you for the first time, I pray that they would um, come and and see me after service, God, so I can continue to to talk with them about that. God, for those who feel called to go and, and share their faith with someone this week, I pray that you would give them the courage to do that, that they would trust you and stop making excuses through their hesitation. God, for those who are feeling called to to maybe go on a missions experience outside of this place, outside of uh, this Judea, God, I pray a special commissioning over them that you would help them find out where it is you're calling them and to give them the courage and the resources they need to be able to go and, and be faithful in that. And God, everyone in this room, I pray a special blessing over their week. God, that you would do something amazing through us. Help all of us to be salt and light wherever we go. We pray this in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Church, thank you guys so much. See you next week.